pause button. All right, we need to have a conversation today about a little bit further with the formation of ions from main group elements. The pattern that we're continuing to describe is what we call the octet rule, whereby most main group elements tend to form compounds through a process where their atoms will either gain, lose, or share valence electrons. In order to get to a highly stable octet arrangement of a noble gas element. Now, remember that main group elements is groups 1a to 8a. Somebody was not clear about that, perhaps, and ignores all the transition elements. We won't try to describe them, and they won't necessarily obey an octet rule. So, thinking about how cations form, they're positively charged, and they get that way because they're losing electrons. Metals are going to make cations, we discussed that today. And sodium, shown here, a sodium atom for one, sodium's a metal, group one, has one outer shell electron, one valence electron. The easiest way for sodium to get to an octet is to lose one electron, and it ends up going from 11 electrons to 10 electrons. The resulting configuration is exactly the same as that full, a, full, a full outer shell as would be equivalent for neon. And so we write it sometimes like this with a triple lined um, equal sign that the electrons of the sodium ion are exactly like those of neon. An example of an anion is one that's negatively charged, created of course by the gain of electrons, is something from group 7a, such as chlorine, and chlorine normally has 17 electrons. The outer shell electrons are 3s2, 3p5, which is a total of 7 electrons. The easiest way for that to become an octet is to gain one electron, and the result is you end up with 18 electrons. More electrons than protons. The 17 protons gives you a minus 1 charge for gaining an electron. So the electron is gained in the outer shell, giving you a full outer shell, and the electron configuration of chlorine is like the neighboring element number 18, namely argon. The electron configuration of argon is what we see here, 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p6, adds up to a total of 18. So there is a few examples we could try here to make sure we get the pattern. So we've done sodium, and whoops, sorry, I keep forgetting to change that. We've done sodium, let's not do that one again. We've done chlorine, but let's do magnesium and think about what the electron configuration of the atom would be. So we start with the same thing every time, 1s2, 2s2, and then from there we go to 2p6, and after 2p6, that's a total of 10 electrons. Magnesium has atomic number 12, and so we have to be sure we've got up to 12 electrons, so keep going. The next ones after 2p6 are the s orbital electrons in the third shell. That would be 3s2. Now, in order to make the ion, what is magnesium going to do? Being a metal, it should lose electrons. In this case, it loses its two outer shell electrons, the two valence electrons from the 3s2 subshell. And those two electrons being lost means you res the resulting ion is going to have a configuration of 1s2. Everything we had except for those last two, in other words, so 2s2, 2p6, and then that's all. That is equivalent to what element then? It's going to be a full octet, a full shell, an octet of s2 and p6. Ten total electrons would be neon. Let's pick another one off this list of choices here. Well, let's do sulfur in line here. Why not? And one way of representing these things that I haven't discussed, but you may have noticed in your homework by now, is to use the simplification of showing the previous noble gas and then adding electrons after it. I can do it both on this one for sulfur. So sulfur is element number, look it up, it's 16. And so we'll have to get up to a total of 16 electrons. We'll start very similar to magnesium. 1s2, 2s2, and then after that we'll have 2p6, 
and after 2p6, the continuing on to the 3s2. 3s2 has to then be followed by some more to get up to 16. The shell the subshell that comes after that will be 3p6, no, not 6, because we only need 4 more. So put in 4 more electrons, and that is a total of 16. The outer shell electrons are a total of six because it's in group 6A, that's consistent. The best way for that to get an octet is to gain two electrons to fill up that outer shell. And so you gain two electrons, and this time I'm going to show you the shorthand. Instead of writing all of it out, we'll write it out up to the previous noble gas to make it simpler. So what's the previous noble gas preceding? Um, sulfur? Well, apparently it would be, oh boy, this is a little tricky to look at, sorry. The 1s2, 2s2, 2p6 portion of things, which is the same as, what is element number 10? It would be neon again. And so, right, this, the configuration abbreviation shorthand is to put neon in a bracket, and then the electrons that come after it follow. So then it would be 3s2, and then instead of just 3p4, we'll have 3p6. And now that is a full outer shell. In this case, we're having a total of not 16, but 18 electrons. And 18 electrons would be equivalent to which element, which noble gas? Check your periodic table. I think we saw one like this a few minutes ago. And that would be argon. Okay, let's do another one. Calcium, element number 20. And number 20 then is going to have a few more electrons than sulfur. So let's shorten the um, notation then to say it would have exactly all the electrons of the previous noble gas. Oh yeah, that would be argon, wouldn't it? And argon is element 18. After argon would be ending with 3p6 in other words you have to have a couple more electrons, so what shell comes next? What shell and subshell? If you think about it, the fourth row of the periodic table is where calcium sits, so it's going to be 4s2. That's showing you that, like magnesium, its outer shell electrons are 2 in an s subshell, because they're broken group 2a. Again, in order to make an ion, which is the goal of this uh, page here, we're looking to see what kind of change has to happen. And so again, like anything else in group two, you're going to lose two electrons. And, uh oh the tool is not cooperating today, gang. Sorry about that. Oh dear. Let's try again. Lose two electrons. And the result is, well, guess what? We'll be back to argon again, won't we? So it's going to be exactly the same electron configuration as what the ion for sulfur resulted in. So we can just list it in this case. I'm going to shortcut it and not write anything further and call it equivalent to argon when it loses two electrons. Now, just to make sure that you're clear, we should note the formula and the, uh, for, or the symbol for each of these ions. Magnesium, when it has lost two electrons, now has more protons than electrons and its charge will be plus 2, or 2 plus, more correctly, the way it's likely to be shown in Master Chemistry. The ion from sulfur, the ion from sulfur is going to have gained two electrons, so it's got two more electrons than protons. Its charge becomes 2 minus, normally, that's what it has. Calcium, calcium is like magnesium, being in group 2A, it gained two electrons, its charge would be 2 plus. Now, we could do fluorine, we could do potassium. Let's do fluorine just for one more. And so the um, fluorine ion, or fluorine atom, sorry, starts off with 1s2. Whoops, uh, the tool isn't liking me today. 1s2, then we go to 2p. No, we don't. Well, let's think again. Let's figure out what we need. First of all, fluorine has nine electrons. 
and the tool is making this very hard for me to keep this going consistently. My apologies. I thought they had this tool to figure it out, but apparently not. So after 21S, we're going to erase that because it's gotten a mess. Let's see if I can turn that on. Oh, I don't have a choice for an eraser. So sorry about that. One other tool right here. No. Nope. Oops, sorry. Okay. So it goes from 1S then to 2S2, which is what we get for four electrons. We're working our way up to nine. After 2S2, better be 2 well, we're actually only need five more electrons. Put them all in the P subshell because it can hold a maximum of six. And so, if we have five there, one more will be enough to make an octet. So, as is the case for anything in group 7A, you will most likely gain an octet, gain one electron to attain an octet. So, gain one electron, and you end up with a configuration that is it's going to have 10 electrons, which is just like its neighboring element. And the neighboring element would be, you said, you guessed it, just the same as what we saw in the first one on this page, namely neon. So I won't write any further. I'll just put the neon in the brackets. And that's how we represent the shorthand. In this case, we could write 2P6 and so forth, as I did up here at the top with the example with magnesium. But that's all right. You'll see that these are the same thing. And so the symbol for the fluorite and the ion from fluorine has a single minus charge represented F with a minus 1. Or you can just write the minus. The 1 isn't really required. Okay, let's do something else. Now, the octet rule, how does it apply to ion? In other words, ions are going to result in getting electron configurations that are like a noble gas. If you have the sodium ion, we looked at that one first, it becomes exactly like neon in having 10 electrons, and the chloride ion is like argon in having 18 electrons. We saw those a few minutes ago. And the point is, these noble gases are very stable. I mentioned that in class Thursday. Noble gases are very unreactive, and they will, the ions that are formed are equivalently um, stable and not likely to change. These chemical unreactivities uh, reflect the idea that there is no tendency for these elements in these forms, as ions now, to undergo any chemical reactions. In this case, because they're unreactive. All right, so let's try a couple more examples. Oh, we already did calcium, but we'll review it again. Calcium has an electron configuration of 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p6, 4s2. Its two valence electrons are the outermost, whoops, go back here. The outermost electrons are the 4s2 in the fourth shell. And so becoming an ion, it will lose two electrons. And the result is it loses the outer ones. The outer ones being the ones that are the valence electrons, and so the resulting configuration is the same thing as element 18, which is argon. All right, my tool is getting ahead of me again. Sulfur. Sulfur has a valence uh, electron configuration of 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p4. The valence electrons are the last shell. The highest numbered shell is shell number 3. In order for it to become an ion, it should gain an octet by doing what? Gaining two electrons this time. If you add two more to the 3P4, it will become full, a full shell. And so it becomes 3S2, 3P6 for its outer shell, which is the same as the one we saw up above, namely argon again. All right, so it turns out that the sulfur ion, S minus 2, and calcium plus two have exactly the same electron configurations. They're still very unique because they have different numbers of protons resulting in different properties. All right, so what kind of ion would be formed for potassium? Well, we've got to think about that question. Is potassium a metal or a nonmetal? If you think about your discussion with activity 11, the point was made that metals are going to form cations. 
And so if we think about what the electron configuration for potassium is and how its that ion's configuration will look, let's think it through. So the electron configuration for potassium, which is element number 19, it should have 19 electrons, will be 1s2, 2s2, and 2p6 comes after that, followed by 3s2. Keep going. What? Well, how many do we have now? 12. Then 3p6, and that is up to 18. We need one more. So the shell that comes after that is 4s. Only one more electron needed. So the outer shell is an s1 electron. In the fourth shell, it's described as 4s1, just like its neighbors in group 1a. The resulting configuration for its ion, well, what kind of an ion it is, is a cation, and it becomes positively charged as a cation, remember that's a positive ion, by losing one electron. Well, if it loses one electron, that will get it back to a full shell with 3s2, 3p6 as the outermost portion. And so if you wanted to write it all out, you could, but I'm going to be lazy and put the uh, quote marks here to represent that. The outer shell then is 3s2 and 3p6, and that would be the configuration of the ion for the potassium ion. If it's going to have a cation, having lost one electron, the charge is plus one, so you write K plus. The other way of writing this then, of course, instead of using those quote marks, is to represent the first electrons from the 1s2 up to the 2p6 as the noble gas that has those, and that would be neon. So you could write neon followed by those other uh, electrons from the fourth shell. But equivalently stated to all of this, these are exactly the same as the electrons for argon. So that's another way of doing it too. All right, another example. What about bromine? So what type of ion would be formed from bromine? Well, is it cation or anion? Find bromine on your periodic table. It would be, let's see, look, look, look fast. It's element number 35. You don't have to memorize these. You'll always have a periodic table handy for you. Use when it's an exam. So anything on the right side over there in group 7 is a non-metal. It will make an anion. Then we'll let's discuss how to draw its electron configuration. Its configuration for the atom is going to be everything to the previous noble gas. Well, let's make our life easier and do the noble gas configuration that precedes bromine, and that would be argon. And that's shown up above here, so you've seen it at least once or twice in this presentation. Following argon, you're going to have to have some more electrons. Well, let's take a look here. So the configuration after argon means that you're down to the fourth row of the periodic table, so you're going to go to 4s, two electrons there. Now bromine has a ways to go. And the electrons that follow after here is the not ones that you'd have to remember to figure out, but that would be the third D, sh the 3D shell completely filled up with 10 electrons. I think you've seen something like this in your homework. Followed by the next P subshell. So it's 4P. Well, how many more do we need? Argon is 18, plus 2 is 20, plus 10 is 30. So we need five more. So it should be 4P5. And those 5p electrons in that outer shell, combined with the 4s2, make for the valence shell for bromine. And in order to become an ion, it's going to be an anion, as you recall, then it should have to gain an electron to be a full outer shell. When it started with 8 or 7, sorry, then it only needs to gain 1 become a, get to an octet, and the configuration of the ion that results is going to be like something else now. What next element is there that one more than bromine? It's going to end with 4s2, it's a, and of course we still had argon's electrons to, get to begin with, same thing as argon, and then 3d10, and so we have, after that, 4p6, and those all together 
as the octet of the fourth shell of 4s24p6 is exactly the same electrons as element number 36, which is krypton, another noble gas. Okay, again, this is noted in brackets because that's saying it's the same configuration as krypton in this case. All right, so we've already done magnesium. I'll let this one go. Nitrogen is another one we haven't done, so let's talk that one through. You could think through magnesium again from the previous page. Nitrogen, again, is a nonmetal in group 5, so it should make an anion. Its electron configuration doesn't take as long as some because nitrogen only has 7 electrons. Okay, so starts with the same old pattern. 1s2, 2s2. 2p, wait a minute, how many do we need now? So we have four, we're up to seven, so we only need three more now. So after the two s subshells, we'll need three more. Now, having a total of how many valence electrons? This would be five valence electrons. What do we have to do to get to an octet? Again, we want to have to um, make it up to eight, so you either gain three or lose five. The obvious, simpler choice here, I hope it looks a bit clear to you, is to gain some electrons, namely three electrons, to get up to an octet. And so the resulting configuration for the ion is going to look not too surprising. So we have 1s2, 2s2, 2p6. The 2s2, 2p6 becomes the outer shell electron, which is an octet. Again, that's a total of 10 electrons which is the same as the nearest noble gas to nitrogen, which is neon. All right, hope some of these examples have been helpful to you. The whole point is all of these things where ions are formed are described as electron transfer reactions. The metals are going to donate electrons away to the nonmetals, forming ions in ionic compounds. Ions that have noble gas electron configurations are very stable and the consequence is you have opposite charges. So a metal is going to give you a cation, and non-metal will give you an anion. The cation and the anion attract to form an ionic bond held together by atoms where the electrons were taken, not shared, as you may have heard recently. So the ionic bond is simply an electronic electric attraction between opposite charges. Now, these things will occur in what we call formula units. The formula units that have to be the smallest group of ions that is electrically neutral. Simple cases are going to be things like a plus one and a minus one that would be the case for sodium with chloride, as in table salt. We're going to see that example some more. And so the formula unit there will be one of each. In this particular example, the sodium would perhaps be this one here, the smaller one, because it's got a smaller number of electrons, and the chloride would be the green one, or blue, hello. So one of each makes a um, electrically neutral unit. The metal in this case being the sodium, the chloride, the chlorine, and an ion now is called chloride is the nonmetal. Another example would be if you have a plus two metal with a minus one nonmetal. And an example of a plus two metal would be sodium's neighbor, magnesium. And this magnesium combining with chloride is going to have to combine in a different ratio to end up with an electrically neutral unit. In this case, you'll have the plus two cation combining with two of the anion to come up with an electrically neutral unit. We looked at those again in class on Thursday with activity 11. Ionic compounds, you will need to think about this, and I mentioned it today. As normally a metal with a nonmetal. Two opposite sides at the periodic table, good thing to remember. Here's an example of what sodium looks like as a solid reacting with chlorine gas, and the resulting powder, crystalline solid, is the sodium chloride. The process of the reaction creates a lot of heat and white smoke, it's rather dramatic. If you look on Mastering Chemistry, there's a movie about the formation of sodium that's quite interesting to watch. Um, but I can show you where that is after a little bit. The only other pieces I want to discuss briefly now are properties of ionic compounds. These are all in the book, but sometimes you like to hear someone help you describe them. The properties of ionic compounds with their oppositely charged ions is that you result in things that are electrically conducting solutions 
as long as you can dissolve them in water. Many do, not all of them, but many do. And so the result is you can put electrodes in a beaker and pass a current through them and the light bulb still lights. So the, there's elect electrodes in there when there's ions in there, the light bulb lights. Um, another property is they will shatter if they're sh struck sharply because of the nature of the ionic bonds. And one of the key things to notice that will get mentioned many times along the way as you progress, I hope, is that they have very high melting points. One classic example that's kind of a nice one to think about is good old ordinary sodium chloride, which is table salt. Because of the crystalline structure, the regular pattern of repeating, ion, repeating pattern of ions, as shown in your textbook, has a melting point that's way hot, hotter than your oven is going to go. So 800 Celsius is an example of a very high melting point. All right, that's all I needed to show you for this Tegarty presentation. I do want to give you a, a moment to see where to find some things in Mastering Chemistry. So I'm going to stop this, and I'm going to go to my browser. And here's Mastering Chemistry. The study area, I think on yours, looks something like this with mine. And the study area offers you a way to get to some resources. If you access the study area, it takes a minute to load. And you look at the top here, and the top makes you have to select a chapter. And initially, it takes a little bit to get there. And my, I will let, pause while it does. Once this page loads, you'll notice at the top here, there's a drop-down menu that can, allows you to select chapters, and I'm going to show you one from chapter 2 that I didn't have a chance to do in class. You have to hit the go button or nothing will happen. And for each chapter there's an e-text, if you've got it, if you paid for it. There's some lecture PowerPoints if you choose to use them. They're really pictures and text from the book and uh, figures. Um, the ones that I like are the movies and animation. I would like you to tr consider trying those. And there's also question sets. If you like them, they're also good for practice. And so the movies and animations, for one, there's one about doing electron configurations in Chapter 2 materials. There's one about flame tests for metals. It's kind of fun. It's not it's very colorful. I would encourage you to look at those. And then I want to show you something from Chapter 3, which is not available at the moment. When the page refreshes to allow me to view this menu at the top, I can go to a different chapter. This time I'm going to go to Ionic Compounds. There's some good resources in there. You have to hit the Go command. And once that page reloads for you, it's got the same materials for... Whoops, I got Chapter 4. How did I get that? That was an error. Now that I'm going to Chapter 3, when the page reloaded, it took a minute. It's much slower than I imagined. I'm not sure whether that's my system or theirs. And we go to Chapter 3. This time I'm looking at movies and animations. Movies and animations for that chapter include some nice things... Some nice things that help you remember how to use ions in the octet rule. We'll learn about naming anions and cations next week. And there's another one for polyatomic ions and some things with Lewis symbols. So there's a good variety of things in here that might be helpful study aids to you. Again, also the um, question sets are self-quizzes for every chapter. Good resources to know and to try if you're looking for some extra practice. Let's see if I can get those to load. Wow, they're being a little slow today, but that's where they are. All right, enough for today. Good luck with your studying.